Are we good? We got a class. Hello and welcome, everyone. Oh, we're, go we're going. Um, it's uh, thank you. Hello and welcome, everyone, to the Varsity Tutors Wildlife Creature Club, where uh, if you followed Dr. Evan Anton on, on Instagram, you saw him just go live to make sure everybody knew about tonight's class because it's going to be a great one. Um, you've probably heard the saying if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. As the lucky host of these star courses, I can agree with that. And so, because there are so many animal lovers out there, we vetted all the vets to find a veteran of all things veterinary. And we've got probably the greatest and most famous veterinarian in the world, Dr. Evan Anton here to teach us all about living that vet life. Now, as he'll tell you, one of the great things about working as a vet is that you get to interact with animals all day, but he does like interacting with people too. So one big call to action for you is let's keep this interactive. He's gonna ask you some questions and we want you to ask him some questions. The chat panel to the right of the screen is where you can make all of that happen. Ask any questions you've got throughout the class, and, and he knows that uh, the people have a lot of vet questions. So we'll spend the last 10 to 15 minutes interviewing Dr. Anton with all of your questions. Also make sure you've got a camera nearby and a pet would be helpful too, because in about 30, 35 minutes, we're gonna give everyone an opportunity to lean into the screen, take a picture with Dr. Anton. And if you upload it to Instagram, tag Dr. Anton and Varsity Tutors, you'll be entered to win an autographed copy of his new book, Worldwide Vet. So make sure you've got those cameras ready. All right. With all that said, we've got a lot of aspiring animal lovers here, or not aspiring animal lovers, aspiring veterinarians and current animal lovers. So whether you've always dreamed about being a vet or you just want to know what life in the veterinary office is like when you're not looking, uh, we've got Dr. Anton here. Dr. Anton, tell us all about it. Hey, you guys, thank you so much for joining me today. I've been so excited to talk about this here on Varsity Tutors. These are questions I get every day at the hospital and on social media and pretty much anywhere I go, people are always talking about wanting to become a vet and how do we become a vet? So that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, I myself am a small animal exotics and wildlife veterinarian. I practice at Conejo Valley Veterinary Hospital in Thousand Oaks, which is near Los Angeles in Southern California. And I love working with pets. I've grown up with all kinds of different species, uh, you know, as a kid and all my life and, you know, dogs and cats too. I work with dogs and cats regularly, but I'm also very passionate about wildlife. I love getting in the wild and interacting with wild animals and their native habitats. And then of course, I love giving back to these animals and working with them uh, and helping them whenever I can as a veterinarian when they do need help for, for injured or orphan wildlife, for example. All right, so. Today, we're going to call it today's prognosis. So prognosis basically means like an outcome. Uh, and that, that is a nice little veterinary term we often use. We've got us ourselves divided in three sections. In section one, we're going to talk about more about the typical day of a life of an event, things you can kind of expect to see day to day, or at least at some point in the course of a week. Uh, we're going to talk about in section two, a crazy day in the life of a vet. So some of the craziest things I've been, been fortunate to be a part of and species and stories. And I think you guys are going to love this part too. Um, and then, uh, you know, section three, I want to chat more about the logistics of becoming a vet and how to live your life as a vet and a little bit about my story and how I became a vet. All right. So because these, these are interactive courses and I want you guys to engage, you got a lot of animal lovers here and young aspiring vets, like Brian said. So got to ask you guys, uh, what is the most common type of veterinary appointment do you think that I see? And I just want to get your guesses here, get some answers coming in. Most common type of veterinary appointment. What's the number one reason I see an animal at the vet hospital? Oh, we got some good ones. We got vomiting dog. We got dog ate something he shouldn't have. Dog fights. Yeah, all good answers. All good answers here. All right, we still got some answers coming in. Let's see, all right. Well, I'm going to tell you guys, a typical day in the life doesn't always have those things. Now, all those things happen. Dogs eat things they shouldn't, they get into fights, you know, all that crazy stuff is definitely part of the job. But a typical day is more about preventative medicine. Okay, so when I'm talking about preventative medicine, I'm talking about vaccines and deworming and regular health exams and annual exams and regular blood work. A lot of the same reasons that you or I go to the doctor, you know, and a lot of the similar uh, conditions that we see in pets are things related to skin issues or allergies. Uh, dental disease is very common. For example, about 75 to 80% of dogs and cats have some degree of dental disease by just two years old. So this is something we, we uh, work with uh, and work on on a very regular basis. So that's, that's actually some of the more common stuff that we do uh, in between you know, the emergencies and all the crazy stuff. Um, you know, that's, it's, it's, 
establishing a relationship with your local vet when you have animals that you care for is super important because they are kind of like your coaches. They're going to help you with this preventative medicine, how to care for these animals. This is really important with exotic animals too. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, our pets are a lot like us. We, you know, our doctor wants to see us at least once a year to do annual health checks. And I, I have the same kind of plan with my patients where I want to see them at least once a year. And when they're older, if they have other compromised health issues, maybe every six months, maybe every three months. So there's a lot of parallels, but uh, at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's a lot like human medicine. And these are a lot of the, the kinds of cases that we're seeing. But like I said, a typical day is not always typical stuff. So th these images, I wanna show you guys some of my typical stuff and some of my atypical stuff. So I've got a big cat and a dog on the left. And then of course, in the bottom, you can see a couple geckos on my shirt and I'm working with some exotics. In the top middle, that's a duck. That's a wildlife animal that I was working with and I'm giving an injection uh, medication, uh, intramuscular injection. And then the far right, I just, I was so impressed by this bunny's ears that we had to, uh, we had to get a picture. It was just too much. So any day, what I'm getting at here is you never know what you're gonna see. Don't expect to see basic same stuff every day. You're not, no two days are gonna be alike and you're always gonna see different stuff. So when we talk about some of the crazy things that you can do in, as a vet, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of different fields of vet medicine. We'll, we'll also be talking more about that, but I mentioned I like working with wildlife. I'm very lucky that I get to work with wildlife around the world. So this is uh, a young black rhino and they are critically endangered. There's maybe a couple thousand left in the wild in Africa. And um, this is in Kenya. And when you work with exotics, so, you know, in vet school, it's four years. It's a lot of school. And that's after going to college, you go to vet school in the US and we learn a lot, but we can't learn about every animal. We're not going to learn the ins and outs of rhinos or elephants or crocodiles or all these other species we might be working with. So we have to extrapolate from other animals. So I want to ask you guys, this is another engaging question. I want to interact with you guys on here. When I'm working with something like a rhino, what more common animals do you think I'm actually referring to when it comes to their medicine? So some of the more common animals that might be similar to rhino, what do you think comes to mind when I'm doing medicine with a, with let's say a black rhino or a white rhino in Africa? All right, we got some good stuff coming in. I see dogs, elephants. We don't learn a ton about elephants in vet medicine, but yeah, that's another one. Hippos, lots of other big mammals, cattle, cow. Yeah, lots of good stuff. All right, well, I'm gonna tell you when I'm working with rhinos, Believe it or not, when it comes to their physiology and whatnot, the most, the most similar animal that I can extrapolate from is a horse. The GI tract, for example, of a rhino is something that's very delicate and it's something that can be compromised when a rhino is stressed or sick or has other health issues going on. And the horse GI tract is almost the exact same as a rhino. When I say GI, I'm saying gastrointestinal. So their esophagus to stomach and their intestines and all their guts, very similar to a horse. Uh, fun little side note, the reproductive tract of a rhino, especially the female, is actually more similar to a pig. So maybe you learned something today. I hope you did with that, but I found that interesting when I started working with rhino. But it's all about extrapolating and, you know, finding the next closest species. When I work with a binturong, which you guys may or may not know what it is, I didn't learn anything about binturongs in vet school. I wouldn't be surprised if some of the clinicians I work with even know what a binturong is, but I have to extrapolate from one of the next closest animals. All right, so we're talking about this wild, crazy stuff. And I've got three images because I've got three really crazy stories I want to share with you guys. So the first one is on the left, you're looking at an anaconda. Okay, so one of my craziest reptile patient stories was a uh, yellow anaconda. So they're a little bit smaller than the green anaconda. This one was a rescued snake. It had some malnutrition issues and it wasn't in great health and it was living with some other snakes. Now, when the person I was working with rescued the snake, she had no idea that it had, it had been impregnated by another male. And so we actually learned that later on when we were taking some x-rays, looking for other things. On an x-ray, we saw all these little baby skeletons and thought, oh my gosh, you know, we've got 20 little baby anacondas in here. This is kind of crazy. We eventually got to the point where we, she, she gave birth to one snake, okay? And when anacondas give birth uh, in New World pythons in the Americas, they give live birth, okay? They're not born in eggs, like for example, a Burmese python, a reticulated python in the old world in Asia, they would give birth to eggs. 
anacondas give live birth. She gave, had one little snake and we knew there was about 19 or 20 of them left in there. And it was taking, you know, a bit too long for her to start giving birth to the other ones. And it was probably related to her malnutrition issues. So we tried our best with medications and I gave her different injections, actually similar to what humans get, calcium and oxytocin. That's another advanced story. We can talk about medications another day, but anyways, the medications were not working. She wasn't responding. We got to a point where we had no choice. And just like in people, we had to pursue a C-section, a cesarean section. So that's something we do in animals when they can't give birth on their own. And it's becoming uh, an emergency where the babies have to be evacuated from the mom. Because snakes are long and skinny, all of their organs are long and skinny. Okay. And so this anaconda that was about seven feet long, when she was in that reproductive phase full of babies, the uterus is a very, uh, uh, an organ that can change dramatically with size. And her uterus is where all the babies were. And that uterus was about five feet long. I'm not even, I mean, you know, it's like this long. Okay. And I could not make a five foot incision in the snake to pull out babies. So I actually had to do four little miniature C-sections on the same snake. So I would go in around the first uh, foot, foot and a half and make like a little six inch incision, pull out as many babies as I could in the area, close up the, the, the uterus, the uh, coelom, which is kind of like their abdomen and the skin, and then move on to the next section and do the same thing, pulling out babies, closing up, pulling out babies, closing up, and one more section, pulling out babies, closing up. And it was this crazy story. And the snake, the mom snake did great. And uh, it was a really fascinating surgery. I've not done it before or after that. I don't know if I will again. It was one of those unique things, but it was very cool. And I wish I had some more footage to show you guys, but I, I hope the story makes sense and, and you follow along there. My next story that I want to share with you was a wildlife patient. And this was an opossum that came to me uh, at the hospital from a good Samaritan. And an opossum, by the way, this is North America's only native marsupial. Okay, so they have a little pouch similar to like what kangaroos and wallabies and, and koalas have. Um, but they're not found in Australia, they're just in North America. Anyways, this opossum had been bit by maybe another dog or a raccoon or something. And her right arm was severely damaged. It was in such bad shape. It was necrotic. It wasn't going to live. And the whole thing looked bad. And it was so infected and, 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 and so advanced that I think there's a good chance she wouldn't have made it had we not intervened surgically. And so you can see she doesn't have a right arm anymore. I surgically amputated the arm in her best interest and got all the bad stuff off. And I took it off of the shoulder, which is similar to what we would do in dogs and cats. Again, I had to extrapolate how to amputate an opossum's arm. I never learned in vet school or anywhere. And so I had to think about, okay, the anatomy is similar and the other small mammals we work with, I'm gonna go with that. And that's what I did. And she ended up doing great in surgery. She came out like a champ. And I, had, I sent her to a wildlife educational rescue where they use her as a, an educational animal. Now, because she doesn't have one of her front arms, she's not a good candidate to be released in the wild, but she does great in captivity. And she was a tough little kiddo. And she was only about uh, maybe four or five months there, pretty young, young little animal. And the next story I wanna share, also a really fun one. Let's throw a possum again. Uh, this is another reptile surgery, okay? And so this is one of the craziest things in the world to me because, okay, I'm, I'm doing what's called a cystotomy on a sulcata tortoise. A cystotomy means you're opening up the urinary bladder. Okay, and the reason you might open up a urinary bladder is because there's urinary tract stones. That's probably the most common reason to do a cystotomy where you open up the urinary bladder. And this sulcata had really big stones in its bladder. And those things can accumulate with uh, maybe slightly improper diet over time. She had way too much calcium in her diet and her calcium just ended up becoming like a little calcified stone in her bladder. And there was no way she was gonna pee it out herself. So we had to go in surgically to remove it. And the crazy thing about this story is when you go into the, the coelom or the abdominal space where all the organs are on a tortoise, there are a couple different approaches and you're looking at part of the shell. That's part of the plastron, the lower shell of a tortoise. You actually remove part of the shell and you can see me fitting it back in on the tortoise there. You remove it and keep it in some saline soap gauze and set it aside. And it totally lives and comes back when you apply it back to the tortoise. So you'll see here in a second, you'll see me putting some epoxy around the uh, outside of the surgery site. And then you'll see some epoxy right there. I'm putting it on the actual square of the tortoise, the part of the tortoise shell that I removed entirely and not putting it in that little line. You'll see a little line there where the surgery is. No epoxy is going right on that line. I don't want it getting into the surgery site where we cut or into the body just on the outside. 
And then over that epoxy, I apply a fiberglass layer and then that heals. And look at that square. That was totally off the tortoise and totally put back on. This is something I didn't know about before vet school and just one of those fascinating surgeries that I love sharing with people and explaining that, you know, this, this, this medical field is so interesting and there's so many different things you can do and so many things you'll learn and so many neat patients and procedures. So this was a really fun one. And um, this was one I did at the hospital, Kaneha Valley Veterinary Hospital where I practice. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. And maybe you learned something there. I don't know if anybody knew that you could take part of a tortoiseshell off intentionally and then put it back on. Pretty crazy stuff. All right, so let's jump into section three. And we're gonna talk about, you know, how to become a vet, how do I really pursue this pathway? And so again, these are engaging lectures. I wanna ask you guys, why would you become a veterinarian? Why is it that you wanna be a vet? We got some answers coming in. So I just want to preface, I hope you're not saying that it's because uh, you, you know, you think you want to make a lot of money or that you think it's an easy profession to get into uh, because it's not. It's pretty challenging, actually, just to be just to get into vet school is not easy to get through vet school is not easy. And being a veterinarian also has very real challenges. It's all very, very rewarding. I love what I do and have zero regrets uh, in working towards becoming a vet and being a vet but it's not easy and it doesn't pay nearly as much as medical school does, but it's a really fascinating profession. And there's some things that I wanna talk about with you guys that, that, I, that you wanna pursue uh, in becoming a vet. And so when we talk about this and you're really serious and think you wanna be a vet, it doesn't hurt to start now. Now, some of you guys are pretty young watching and you're limited in terms of the amount of experience and things you can do. A lot of places you need to be 15 or 16 years old to volunteer with a vet or at a wildlife rescue or a shelter or with other you know, uh, people in the animal field, but you can start learning, okay? You know, and, and for you parents that are watching with your kids or you know, parents watching that you know, you know your kids wanna be a vet, uh, just start facilitating that, fuel that for them, you know, and help them learn and, and get them books related to animals and, and, and help them learn about the animal world. And the more they can learn now, the more prepared they're gonna be down the road. Um, and that goes for you know, doing well in school. There's some components that we'll talk about that are really important towards becoming a vet that, uh, that vet schools are looking at to make sure that you have qualified and satisfied and done well at. And so when it comes to that, they're looking at grades. That's probably the most important thing. So it's never too soon to start learning really quality study habits and doing well in school and getting good grades. High school grades are important to get into college. College grades and sometimes high school grades are important to getting into a veterinary school. So grades are super, super important. Another one is test scores. Now they're looking at things called standardized tests. So that's down the road for some of you guys. I don't want you stressing about the GRE right now, but this is a test you'll be taking down the road. And it's a big all day test where you sit down, you study for it weeks in advance. It's got multiple sections, it's a whole thing. And uh, that's another important factor. Another factor is experience. And now vet schools wanna see, okay, like what are your, your hands-on experience actually working with animals? Like, have you actually done a little bit of this? Do you have something to contribute? when you're in vet school and, and some, some, some experience to reflect on. And so they wanna see if you spent time with other veterinarians, maybe other researchers or scientists, maybe at wildlife rescues, maybe at dog shelters or cat shelters or other animal shelters. You know, they wanna see that kind of thing. And that's number three. Number four is something called letters of recommendation. And so throughout your path towards becoming a vet, you're gonna be spending a lot of time with certain kinds of people. So this, you can get letters of recommendation from mentors, basically. Okay, these are people that have worked with you and they said, you know what, um, little, little Billy here is, is a very hard worker and he's a quick learner and he you know, he's really brings a lot of value to the work that I do as a researcher or a veterinarian or whatever. And so you wanna develop a good relationship with the people that you do have experience with and even in school. One of my letters of recommendation came from one of my chemistry teachers, for example, one of my professors. So um, it's important to keep that in mind too as you're going down this road. Don't, 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 uh, don't, don't go half effort, go full effort all the way and it really pays off. Um, so, and a little bit about vet school. I just want to tell you guys about my road a little bit. You know, I always loved animals, knew I wanted to, animals to be a big part of my life. I knew that from day one. I've been a big wildlife and animal and pet freak. And, uh, you know, it wasn't until college that I realized I wanted to be a vet. When I made that decision, I changed majors and I started studying evolution and ecological biology. I started volunteering with other veterinarians in town. I saw, started volunteering at a wildlife rescue, my local one called the Greenwood Wildlife Rehabilitation Sanctuary. And I just had a vision 
and took all the steps necessary to get into vet school. And when you're pursuing big goals and dreams like this, that vision is so important because that's how you see the final goal, the final end product of what you want to be. And then you think about all the steps necessary to get there. And it's the hard work and the time that, that, that also is a big part of this that you have to put in in order to become that. Now, when you're in vet school, it's, uh, it can vary a little bit from one school to another. Now, there's only about 32 vet schools in the country, give or take. And some of them have the same education for all students. Some of them you can track a little bit. So you can track small animal, which is like dogs and cats and smaller pets. You can track large animal, which is like equine, like horse medicine or cattle or maybe pigs, things like that. Um, and so I went to Colorado State. I tracked small animal. And I also took every exotic animal elective I could along the way. And we had a few different courses each year that were available as electives to take. And I got as much experience as I could with exotics knowing that it's just not conventional and I'm going to have to do a lot of outside learning to work with these animals. And these were the first steps to really start with that. Um, and so the first two years of vet school, you're really doing classroom stuff. You're in the classroom. The first year you're learning anatomy and you're learning about physiology and just the basics of how these animals function and the basics about diseases and things like that. And year two is a little bit more advanced learning where you're learning more about medications, a little bit more advanced in disease processes, and whatnot, getting into a little bit more detail. At Colorado State, the third year, where it was half lecture, where we're learning pretty intense in-depth classes and learning emergency medicine and endocrine diseases and all kinds of crazy stuff. And then the second half of the day, uh, we would be in clinics where we'd be spending time with fourth year students as well as interns and residents. And of course, clinicians who are the ones that guide each different rotation. And when I say rotation, I mean, we're talking about you can go to cardiology, dermatology, surgery, uh, small animal uh, uh, medicine, you know, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of different uh, rotations you'll be taking along your path. Uh, and they can vary if you track, if you're at a school that tracks. And then fourth year, it's all rotations, no more classroom, you're doing rounds with the clinicians all day, you're seeing patients hands on all day, you're running cases, uh, uh, you know, as, to the best you can by yourself all day. And then when you have to consult with your clinicians, you say, hey, okay, I've got this patient that came in with these issues. And I think maybe we should run these diagnostics and then maybe these treatment options would be appropriate. They're going to help you bounce all those things off of, of, of you and the cases that you're seeing. And then you graduate. And before you know it, you're a real veterinarian and you're working with animals and it's all on you. And so that's a whole other story. And that's something we can chat about too, maybe in the future. But I always recommend trying to find a practice where you're working with other people that can also help mentor you. But that's way ahead of the game. So you guys still have lots of other things to think about. Um, when it comes to working with animals, you know, a lot of us, probably any of you guys watching are big animal fans. I know you guys are. I know you love animals. And so you don't have to be a vet to work with animals. That's obviously one of the first professions that all of us as kids learn about that are your classic quintessential animal-centric professions. But there's so many other things you can do. You can, of course, still work in a vet hospital and not be a vet. You can be a veterinary technician, which are very hands-on with animals. When I work with my vet techs, which are super important to my job and being a good vet, they're doing a lot of hands-on stuff. And I say, hey, I need you to give this animal an injection of this. I need you to prep this animal for surgery. I want you to do some inpatient treatment for that animal. And so they're really doing a lot of hands-on stuff, engaging and interacting with the animals. And then, of course, you don't have to be in a vet hospital at all. You could be working as a zookeeper. You could be working as a biologist or an ecologist out in the field doing research. You could work with lab animals. You can work with food animals. I mean, there's so many different avenues of working with animals um, that vet school is not a, a prerequisite to doing so. Becoming a vet's not necessary for just that. But, uh, you know, within the vet field, there are so many different ways to go. You know, when you become a vet, you can be specialized and focus on a certain aspect of veterinary medicine. Say you really love cardiology and heart function and, and all of that. And so you can become a cardiologist. Say you love working in the operating room and you just love doing surgery. You can become a surgeon. You be can become an orthopedic surgeon. And some people get double specialized where they specialize in neurology and surgery and they become a brain surgeon or a, a neurologic surgeon and work with all kinds of neuro neuro neurology cases. You can become an eye specialist, skin, a cancer specialist. I mean, the list goes on. There's so many different avenues you can take once you become a vet and having a veterinary you know, diploma just opens your world up to a lot of different aspects of working with animals. And that's, that's one of my favorite things about it. Now, I'm a general practitioner. I love working with exotics and wildlife, but I get to do a lot. In one day, I can be a surgeon and a radiologist and an ophthalmologist and a dermatologist where I'm doing a little bit of each of these things every day. I'm not saying I'm a full-on specialist in each of these categories, but I know enough to be able to help and work with our patients and our pets and our wildlife too.
All right. Hey, I'm exhausted. You talk about what you do in a given day. And uh, I think a lot of us are tired. Good thing it's Friday because it sounds like you've had a, a heck of a week. So a uh, huge thanks for uh, for filling us in. I know we want to spend a lot of time on people's questions. So thanks to everyone who's sending in questions because uh, you know it is a topic I think a lot of people want to know a lot more about and I think got pretty inspired by. So, um, so fantastic. While you have a chance to get those questions in, so a couple things. One, remember we said have a camera nearby. It's about time to do that photo contest. So remember, get a camera. Uh, we'll have you lean into the screen. If you've got your pets with you, that's even cooler. And uh, lean into the screen. We'll have you take a picture with Dr. Anton in just a second. I'll, uh, I'll uh, fill a little bit of time while you go run and, uh, and grab those cameras. Uh, if you're I'm gonna, camera I'm in hand. Henry right? too. Oh, perfect. Yes, please. I'll, I'll have my little pet here too. Okay. All right, great. I'll be right back too. Awesome. Um, so while everyone's getting their pets and their cameras, for those who are still, uh, still sitting here, one, uh, get your questions in. We've got a good 15 minutes or so for questions. We want to get as many of those answered for you. Um, two, like Dr. Anton said, it, it helps to get involved early and, and you know make sure you're passionate about working with animals. There's some ways to do that through Varsity Tutors. We've got the entire Wildlife Creature Club with, uh, with all kinds of animal classes. My favorite are the safari classes on big cats and other safari animals like, uh, like the rhinos and, uh, and elephants you saw Dr. Anton with. So check those out in the Wildlife Creature Club and uh, we'll be good to go. Also, a little bit of a secret if uh, Dr. Anton isn't all the way back yet. Someone out here, thank you for doing that. Googled it and it's Dr. Anton's birthday tomorrow. I don't know that we can all <laughs> sing, um, but uh, happy birthday on behalf of everyone. If you guys reach out to him on Instagram, um, that's a great idea as well. But with, uh, without further ado, um, Dr. Anton, maybe give him a countdown or something and we'll, uh, we'll take that picture. Sounds good. Are you guys ready for this picture? We're getting some selfies. We got Henry here. He's in his little coat. He's got his bow tie. He's feeling very photogenic. Say hi, Henry. Say hi. We're in varsity tutors talking about being a fit. You're so cute. Thank you, Mr. Awesome. Hope we everybody got a great picture and uh, got their pets in there as well. Uh, you'll, if you didn't get the perfect picture, uh, there'll be plenty of opportunities. We'll have uh, Dr. Anton on full screen as he's answering your questions, but we're pretty excited to, uh, to get a lot of those questions out. Um, I think we may have just gotten the answer actually um, when, uh, when you brought Henry on, but uh, we'll make it more genre specific and not uh, individual animal. A lot of people want to know uh, what are your favorite types of animals to work with? Well, I'll tell you, when I, for, you know, at a very young age, when my passion for animals and, and wildlife in the natural world really started, um, I was crazy about reptiles. Now, I had a dog that was my best friend. I love dogs, too. I love pets and working with pets. And the human-animal bond is extremely special to me. And you can see that Henry and I here have a very, a very, good, a very good bond. But I found reptiles so fascinating. I loved, you know, just crocodiles and how they're like modern day dinosaurs. And as a kid and as an adult still, I find dinosaurs fascinating. I loved snakes and venomous snakes and king cobras have always been among one of my favorite animals. So um, yeah, the reptiles hold a very special place in my heart. I think you should have covered Henry ears, Henry's ears when you said that. He was right there listening to you. But uh, oh, I guess work that. on and work on and uh, spend time with our, our two totally different things. So I think we'll uh, we'll allow it. So awesome, thank you. Hey, you did an amazing job actually of answering a lot of questions. You know, as they came in, I know they were coming in fast. It was kind of hard to do those. But someone someone asked if you ever had a, a sick snake, and then within minutes the anaconda video came up and on uh, all those oh, yeah. kind of things. But since uh, you know we, we talked to snakes, reptiles, one of the other most common questions are. Um, we'll give you kind of a two-part one here. One, are, are there any animals that you were scared to work with? You know, not necessarily a genre of animal, but an animal came in and was frightened, was aggressive. You know, you were uh, scared to work with. I think let's even just go with that one. And have you ever had any, any uh, occasions where you've been scared to work with an animal? I mean, there have been cases for sure where even a, even a dog can be extremely aggressive. And an aggressive, scared dog that's feeling very defensive and will defensively bite if it feels that it needs to and that kind of thing that can be really scary you know i mean i'm not it's not going to stop me from trying to work with it and help this animal obviously but 
I don't have any innate irrational fears of any species, um, but just certain individuals I've worked with, you know, I know they're going to be a little bit more of a handful and we need to, you know, do our best to reduce the amount of stress that it takes to work with them and keep them comfortable too. Um, but that can happen with any species, cats, dogs, you know, rhinos, crocodiles, you name it. Well, thanks. Well, I admire your commitment as, uh, as someone who had another job kind of working with animals and got scared a lot. I had a paper route and I got chased by quite a few dogs. Oh, uh, someday I was 10. I gave up on the route every once in a while. Really? Just kind of, well, nobody's getting their papers. I uh, admire your uh, tenacity to, uh, to stick with it through fear. So uh, it's a huge, huge thank you there. Um, what about, is there anything that surprised you? Um, so, you know, you knew you loved animals and, uh, you know, wanted to become a veteran. Is there any, uh, I'm sorry, a veteran, veterinarian, I got to finish my words. Um, is there anything that surprised you about like, hey, I didn't realize I would love doing this as much as I do? Um, I think a lot of people don't realize when they get a little bit further down this road towards becoming a vet, how much the profession can be such a people person profession. Uh, working with people is a huge part of the job. And we have to remember, so as a veterinarian, especially if you're one working in a clinical setting or in a vet hospital, you're working with, you know, people's pride and joy, their favorite little buddies in the world. You know, these, these animals are extremely special to these people. And so obviously you, you're going to be prepared to care for the animals, but you also have to be able to uh, work with these people and communicate with them and, you know, make sure everybody's on the same page and make it so they're comfortable with everything going on too. So that's a huge part of the job. And I think a lot of people don't realize now I'm very lucky. I like interacting with people. I consider myself a people person. I enjoy that component of the job. And it's whether I'm in the clinics or out in a zoo working with the keepers or I'm in the wildlife working with the conservationists, you're going to be working with people to some degree. And that's something I enjoy doing personally. But it's something that, you know, I don't think a lot of people think about when they're pursuing the career, what a big component of this career is for most veterinarians. Yeah, that's a great point. It's, it's every, you know, everyone that brings in a pet is their prized possession. It's, it's one of the things they love more than anything in the world. And um, so you're in a position to help both animals and people at the same time. So um, that's, uh, that's pretty amazing. A uh, couple specific questions. Uh, one, uh, so we'll go maybe, maybe rapid fire. If you've got quick answers, if you've got full stories, go with them. Um, one is people want to know about aquatic animals. I've gotten, have you ever worked with dolphins, whales, or, uh, or other aquatic animals? And what was I your got to work like? with a researcher in Morea, which is in French Polynesia near Tahiti, do, uh, getting skin samples of humpback whales. And so I was swimming with humpback whales in open water, and that was super special. Uh, I got to work with some pinnipeds, some seas and seals and sea lions recently at the Marine Mammal Care Center of Los Angeles uh, at their rescue facility. And we actually got to do a release, which was super cool with a couple of harbor seals getting back into the ocean. Um, Dolphins and porpoises, I've not done a lot of work with. I'd love to. I find those animals absolutely fascinating, but not yet, but hopefully one day. Awesome. Well, and like you said, you never know what to expect, right? Every day is different. So it might, might be a day actually uh, relatively soon. Uh, another question is uh, people want to know a little bit about uh, prosthetics and animals. Have you ever been in a situation where uh, you've been working with animals and prosthetic limbs? Yeah, prosthetics are fascinating and they've come a long way in people and in pets. Uh, I think one of the craziest prosthetic patients I worked with was in Sri Lanka uh, last year, and it was actually an elephant. And one of its hind limbs had a severe infection that progressed up the leg to the point where the, uh, you know, above the ankle was pretty destroyed and, and not functional. And we needed to have something. Elephants really need to have four legs to bear weight on. They're so big. It's, it's pretty tough to be a tripod as an elephant. It's just not feasible. So. Um, the doctors out there had developed a really effective prosthetic that worked actually beautifully for this animal. And so every day, the limb that, go, that fits in the prosthetic has to be scrubbed and cleaned and washed just to make sure things are clean and no infections or, or uh, pressure sore kind of ulcers are happening or becoming abscesses or, or health issues. Uh, but the elephant was very used to it, very comfortable with it, very comfortable around its handlers and its caretakers. And I got to be a part of one of the daily... Um, uh, you know, uh, prosthetic changes, essentially. It's almost like a bandage change, but it's a whole prosthetic. Um, I helped with the prosthetic with a llama once in Colorado. That was really neat. I was working with a really cool company called OrthoPet, and they make fascinating prosthetics for a lot of different species and really quality stuff for dogs and cats too. Um, 
But uh, yeah, it's, it's a neat world. And a lot of orthopedic specialists have their hands pretty deep in the prosthetic world. And that's, those, those are going to be the real experts in, in our field of prosthetics. That's fascinating. There was, I think it was last week, there was a viral video on Twitter of an elephant with a prosthetic, uh, maybe, maybe even one that you know. I don't know if it was in Sri Lanka. I think it I was saw just fascinating. Yeah. In Asia. Just, yeah. I think not pretty much everybody that watched it was, you know, tears just kind of yeah. like how amazing that was. Crazy. So it's, it's cool that you've been a part of that. Um, one more specific one on a type of animal. And uh, if, if your answer is no, uh, you know, we have a friend in common who we know works with them, uh, who's coming to Varsity Tutors next week. Have you ever worked with spiders? I've worked with a few different arachnids, um, just here and there. A couple, uh, it's really been tarantulas. Um, and not doing any significant medical stuff. One, man, one of the last ones I saw, this poor guy was stung by a tarantula hawk, which is uh, this big, like, it's like a wasp, I believe, species. And it stings spiders intentionally where it doesn't kill them. It just makes them completely paralyzed they have no motor function and then they lay eggs in the spider to feed off this it's kind of a gnarly parasitism kind of thing i won't get into that <laughs> but that poor guy got stung and we we um yeah things didn't turn out great for him but no but I mean, i'm so pumped that you guys are gonna have phil on you're talking about phil torres right Exactly. Yeah. Phil's on next week uh, with a class all about spiders, which uh, we're really excited about. So uh, and you and Phil are friends, right? Phil's a buddy of mine. And I've always appreciated the, the uh, invertebrate world, whether it was insects or arachnids or what have you. But Phil's love for it just, I think, inspires anybody that watches his work. It gets everybody so excited. And you realize when you get to see these animals up close and he takes all these gorgeous videos and pictures with macro lenses and shares what this world's about when you really get to see that i mean they're like aliens they're just another world and just the evolution and the adaptations and take place in the insect level and the spider level too is so fascinating so i urge you guys to scope it out if you think you're afraid of spiders this might change your mind you might have a whole new appreciation for them and if you already like them you are going to love this lecture it's going to be awesome and he's a very good teacher too yeah, he's amazing. So that, that class is this coming Thursday. So if uh, if you're sad that we only have, you know, five to 10 minutes left of this class, there's uh, there's plenty more where that came from. So, uh, so check out varsityteaters.com and uh, Phil Torres' class, uh, World Wide Webs about the world's coolest spiders is uh, is next week. Also, you mentioned the tarantula hawk. We had uh, Coyote Peterson, the uh, the guy who gets stung by everything. Oh, yeah, I know. Uh, we had him do a class. Too. Oh, nice. Yeah, he did uh, some classes with us in the summer. He's coming back in uh, in a couple months. And uh, he talked all about what it's like to be sung by a tarantula hawk. So um, if, if you're an animal enthusiast, there's plenty more for you here. Um, back to your experience, right? I mean, we know it doesn't have to be uh, – Remember when sitcoms used to do clip shows and they would just kind of promote other episodes? And we got to let's, – let's focus on this one. Um, can you tell us about a, a part of the job that people wouldn't necessarily think about – that's actually kind of a bummer or maybe a worse day on the job that was just sort of, Hey, I thought this would be fun, but you know, this is uh, this is where it gets you down. We've been really positive. We'll, we'll, we'll finish on a high note, but for now, let's get real with people. What's uh, right. what's something that surprised you that was kind of like, Ooh, I didn't like that as much as I thought I would. Right. I mean, I think a lot of people think, you know, I'll post stories or talk about being a vet and working with puppies or kittens or elephants or what have you. And it looks like it's all a lot of fun and it is, but of course, you know, you have to remember at the end of the day, we're working with a lot of people's, their, their babies, you know, it's their, their favorite little thing, their, their best little buddy. And, you know, when you have to deliver bad news, that's not easy. You know, it's, it's a very real part of the job and uh, it's, it's, it's a tough thing to do. And, but, but it's again, where that it's important to have that relationship with your, your the pet owners you're working with, where you can talk about these things and advise them on what to do and how to, you know, what's the best path, path to follow, what's the best interest thing to do for your pet. And one of those things sometimes, unfortunately, is humane euthanasia. And in one way, it's, it's a huge bummer. It's very sad. We have to put pets to sleep. You know, they've, they've, they've ran the course of their life. Uh, the remainder of their days or whatever are not going to be pleasant or comfortable or happy for them. And, you know, we're doing the best thing for them. But at the same time of it being a bummer, it's also a really beautiful thing. And we're so lucky that we can have an animal come in and we know it's got a very bad prognosis, meaning it's not going to live long and it's not going to be comfortable or happy. And it's not going to want to spend the rest of its days like this. Uh, and, you know, when we have an animal in that situation where we know things are only going downhill from here, why have them suffer? Why prolong 
the roughest part of their life, which is often end of life. Why do that? You know, we're, we're so lucky. We're so fortunate. We have an option where we can let them, we can let them have that great sleep and go out peacefully and go out more comfortably before it gets really, really uncomfortable and painful and, and terrible for everyone to see and be a part of. And so um, it's a tough part of the job, but it's, it is a real blessing at the same time. Yeah, I appreciate that perspective. That's, um, you know, definitely it's, there are fun parts of the job, like any job, uh, you know, uh, bosses at varsity tutors, this isn't one of them, but like any job there, there are bad days. And uh, but I think that perspective is, uh, is really helpful. Um, a couple of just fun questions. So let's, let's change gears a little bit. Um, that I just think are, are fascinating. I love when people ask some of these questions you would never have thought of. Um, can you tell if an animal is, uh, you know, left-handed or right-handed or just lefty or righty? Yes, actually, you can for some species. Um, one of my favorites is elephants. And how you can with, with elephants. So elephants, they use their tusks for many different things. It's not just fighting. I mean, they use them for digging, for breaking up branches, for moving around soil, for digging for water holes, you know, trying to find water and tap water. Uh, it's a very big part of their day-to-day -day function. And so with elephants, they almost never have two tusks that are the same length. Usually they have a right tusk and a left tusk, and one of them is a bit longer than the other. And so if you're looking at an elephant and you're seeing where one's longer than the other, I want you to imagine which one do you think they use more? The answer is it's the shorter tusk. It has more wear. More of it's gone because it's been used for more things. So when you ever see an elephant where it's got a short right tusk, it's a right-handed elephant. It's using, that's, that's its go-to tusk to start doing whatever it's gonna do and vice versa if it has a short left tusk. So uh, to answer your question, yes, there are a lot of species that are, are one hand uh, dominant over the other. That's really fascinating. That's really cool. Thank you. Thanks to whoever asked that. That was, uh, that was uh, yeah, that, was, that one just kind of got me. That was a really, really good question. Um, all right. So obviously we've got a ton of animal enthusiasts here and uh, you don't want to draw on your experience. I know you mentioned one of the best things in your career was starting early, volunteering a lot when you were young. Um, can you tell us, you know, kind of a combination of, of advice for how to get started volunteering? Where, where should people, you know, look, who do they reach out to, to, uh, to get started volunteering as early as they can, or just being, you know, being involved with animals. And, uh, you know, maybe if you've got a little bit of your story of kind of how did, how did you hustle to get, you know, one of the fascinating things you talk about exotic animals, exotic places. Um, you know, I think a lot of us would like to be you when we grow up. What's, uh, what's your advice for, for, you know, specifically, who do we ask and, and where do we go to get that valuable experience early? Like sure. You know, I'm glad you used the word hustle because it is a hustle. It's all about being proactive. And that's how I think I've had a lot of my success. I've had a lot of good fortune and opportunity come my way, but the hard work and the hustle and the pro just being proactive in general has been a huge part of it. Um, now, when it comes to volunteering and spending time working with animals, with other professionals that are going to kind of take you under their wing and mentor you, in most places, you have to be 15 to 16 years old to really get good mentorship and good experience in that way. So for some of you guys watching, you might be a little bit uh, too young for that. You can maybe do like a day trip at the vet hospital. If you have a good relationship with your vet, you just want to hang out for a half day or a few cases and just go to rooms. They may or may not be okay with that, depending on local and state laws and everything. Um, but that's a fun option. But when you do get to be that age, you put yourself out there. And you do it as you know as, as effectively and as much as you can. So when I was when I realized I wanted to be a vet, and I was older than how you know some people are when they when they know they want to be a vet. I was already in my twenties, and as soon as I made that clear, confirmed decision, I reached out to my local wildlife rescue, again the Greenwood Wildlife Rehab Sanctuary, and just said, hey, you know I, I love working with animals. I don't have a lot of experience yet. I'm studying to be a vet, and I'll work hard for you. Is there anything I can do? And a lot of these places will have you come volunteer. So these aren't paid jobs. These are, this is you volunteering your time, taking time out of your schedule to, to do this kind of experience and get this experience and this, this sort of work and mentorship and whatnot and learn the ins and outs of wherever you're going, whether it's a vet hospital, wildlife rescue, a research facility, uh, research with, um, with, you know, associated with your college. I also did that. I met up with a herpetology professor and I took his course and I also said, hey, man, I love reptiles. I love, you know, is there anything I can do or a project that one of your PhD students is working on? I could be a research assistant, so forth and so on. And that got me set up to do just that. I helped study uh, on a study about uh, garter snake constriction. And so there's so many different avenues you can take, but being proactive is one of the biggest things. Um, and, you know, when I got to an age where I realized, hey, I can start seeing the world. 
I'm very lucky that I can, but I would save up just enough money and time. And in between school semesters, I would travel to other parts of the world to go find some of my favorite animals in the world and find them in their native habitats. And I studied abroad twice in undergrad, which I highly encourage you to do just to get a worldly perspective as a human, uh, let alone the, the things you can gain in working uh, with whatever field you wanna work with, especially if it's animals or whatnot. So I did one semester in Australia, another one in Tanzania doing a wildlife ecology conservation program. And then when I, when I would travel independently, I would be proactive and I would reach out to wildlife rescues and I would try to send them emails or whatever was possible. And not always as easy at that time because Wi-Fi wasn't as available and there wasn't always a clean line of communication, but I would try to connect with them and say, hey, I am a pre-vet student or I'm a vet student and I've got a little bit of experience here and there. Here's a resume. Is there anything I can do to help you guys out? I'm going to be in your area for a week. You know, please let me know if I can hang out. And some of these places, because communication was tough, especially in their exotic pockets around the world, I would just show up at the door. And I don't encourage that. Please try to reach out to these facilities. Let them prepare for your visit if that's possible. But there are several times where I would just show up and say, hey, I'm Evan and I love working with animals. And is there anything I can do to help? I would love to help and get some experience and, you know, and also help the animals and help you guys as well. Um, being proactive is how I got my job too. You know, my fourth year at vet school, I wanted to practice in Southern California. I didn't have any connections or any jobs or anything lined up. So I took two trips, each lasting about a week, reached out to all the exotic small animal veterinarians I could where they see dogs, cats, and exotic animals and did a day to a half day visit with them. And that was, and gave them each a resume. And that was to get my foot in the door and to meet my colleagues of the regions that I wanna practice in. And maybe if I'm lucky, get a job. And I did just that. And I got an interview that was great at Conejo Valley Vet Hospital. And I've been working there ever since I graduated in 2013. Awesome. That's, um, I, I really appreciate that story too. I think everyone does that, uh, you know, hustle is a huge part of it. And, uh, and you had a lot, a lot of examples to back it up, a lot of hustle in your background. But I think that is an important thing. If you've got a dream, uh, you, know, you think, School is expensive. And so uh, if you can, you know, work for free, actually you're saving money in a way, getting experience that way. And, uh, you know, great way to get your foot in the door. So um, huge thanks for all of your advice, um, all of your stories. Uh, you know, for those of us who probably won't become vets because uh, we've got a pretty good job at varsity tutors for other reasons. Uh, it was just fun to, uh, to look in inside the life of a veterinarian. Uh, for those who are, are on that course that, uh, that you were on, I think it was some amazing advice. So um, huge thanks to, uh, to Dr. Ant and to all of you for, uh, for all of your questions. Um, we, on the way out, we're going to put up the, uh, the rules for the Instagram contest, where to tag us. Remember tomorrow's Dr. Ant's birthday. Birthday. So post your picture, but also go over and uh, say hello to say happy birthday. So on behalf of all of us at Varsity Tutors, Dr. Anton, uh, you know, very, very happy birthday and a huge thanks for what you're doing. Well, um, or what, you, what you've done and for what you're doing. Uh, reminder, come see uh, some of Dr. Evan uh, Anton's friends, uh, including Phil Torres next week talking about spiders. Here are those uh, instructions for the contest and uh, have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you guys so much for having me. Varsity Tutors, thank you guys so much for coming and joining the class today. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. I love talking to kiddos like you and getting you excited about animals and what veterinary medicine and wildlife is all about. So thank you so much. I appreciate it big time. Awesome. Thanks, Dr. Ant. Thanks, everyone. And um, yeah, hope to see you again back here soon. So thank you, guys.